Amen, amen. Isn't God good? I am on number four of these five W's sermon series, and I'm talking to you today about who is God. And it's an easy, it's an easy sermon to make super simple. I could just come out and say God is everything and walk out and feel really good about myself and feel pretty good and feel pretty happy because there are a myriad of titles for God. But uh, I think that there are four that for me are the most important and I want to get into those today. And the first of those is God the Father. In Luke 12, 32, the Bible says, Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. And you know, that's, that scripture is so powerful in the way a father's love works. Because I know a lot about fathers. I got one and I am one. And I can tell you from experience that the idea of giving the keys to the kingdom to your children is exactly what a father's love is like. It is exactly what a father wants to do. So when you think about God the Father, you can think about that scripture and what he wants to do for you, that he gets pleasure from giving you the keys to the kingdom. And God the Father <clears throat> could mean a lot of things, and it's more than just that he created us, because we'll get to that later. I want to search into fatherhood. And if God is a father, <clears throat> then what does that really truly mean? And the three elements of fatherhood that I can think about, and I'm going to go over those. The first one is God the Father provides. Financial and tangible providing is a key element to fatherhood. The world and your family look to you. I got four kids and they eat because I buy. And you, the sons and daughters of Christ, eat because he supplies. Everything that a father does for his children on earth, God does for us as our father. And I want to get into the emotional provided because that's an element that I think a lot of fathers forget about on earth, but our father doesn't forget about. It's not just about the tangibles. It's not just about the fact that when you need something and the bills ain't ready and you don't have enough money and the something comes in the mail that God's the one that provided that for you or that you got a new promotion at your job that elevates your wallet status. It's not just about those financials. God provides for you emotionally. And the reality is for me, I'm going to keep referencing my own fatherhood because it's the best way for me to remind myself I am in charge of creating a safe environment with just the right amount of challenges for growth for my children. Which means God is in charge of creating a safe environment with just the right amount of challenges for you. Your growth is all overseen by God. My children's growth is overseen by me. Your growth is overseen by God. And that means sometimes that struggle you're going through is a part of your growth. My kids sometimes think that we're being too strict or too harsh, or maybe we don't care, but sometimes we got to let life take its course so they can grow. Or sometimes we got to step in the way and do some discipline so we can make sure they grow correctly. And sometimes in your Christian walk, God's going to have to let some things happen to you to get you to grow, or he's going to make some things happen to you to get you to grow. And God is going to do that as a father because as a father, seeing you grow and providing you financial and emotional opportunities is what he is about. Another element of fatherhood is protection. God the Father protects. It is my job to protect my kids from those who would seek to harm them. Trust in God the way a child trusts their father to protect them. It doesn't matter what's gone on that week. It doesn't matter what we've gone through. When my kids are scared, there's a knock at my door, and they go to me. Now, nine times out of ten, fathers can tell you they're looking for mommy. They have a bad dream. They want to talk to their mommy. They don't feel good. They're looking for their mommy. But when danger is around and they're afraid, they come looking for dad because they know I am where they will find peace and comfort. They know I will protect them. Trust in God that way. When things come at your door that you're afraid of, you've got debt or financial situations that are struggles for you. You've got a health scare. There's a doctor's report you don't like. Go knock on your father's door and talk to him. Treat God like children treat their father. 
look up to him, admire him, and know that when he's getting involved, it's going to get fixed. The reason my kids come to me when they think they saw somebody walk by their window and really it was just a tree branch flowing by and their little kid imaginations went crazy is because they know in their minds, if somebody ever did walk by the window, they trust that I'll handle it. And whenever somebody's walking by your window in your spirit world, trust that God's going to handle it for you. It's also my job to protect them from themselves. They may not know it. They may not like it. They may even try to stop me from doing it. But it is paramount to their growth that I protect them from themselves. My son, Logan, and I are very similar, and I see a lot of me in him, which means I see a lot of trouble coming his way if he don't get it under control the way I didn't. <laughs> And so I tell him all the time, you're getting yourself in trouble for no reason. He'll get frustrated and aggravated and he'll act out on it. And I'm like, well, hey, I got a thing that I tell him. And I'm like, that was a, what we call a dumb choice. And I remind him that sometimes your decision making is bad. And often he's frustrated with me for getting on to him because he's like, well, if they didn't frustrate me. And it's my job to say, listen, I'm protecting you from you. The mistakes you're making right now are little, but someday you'll be big and they could do damage. And it's my job to make sure that you don't do too much damage in this world. And it's my job to make sure that all of the potential you have isn't squandered because you're getting in the way of it. That's you in the spirit realm. God is telling you there is so much potential in you. And I'm trying to stop you from squandering it. So sometimes God is protecting you from yourself. A lot of Christians struggle with self-doubt, and God is trying to get them out of that. A lot of Christians struggle with having too much. And a lot of Christians think, well, if God would just provide for me, then I would, you know what, I would even take all my money and give it to the church. When in reality, if God gave you a million dollars, we'd never see you again. And God is protecting you from you. And with my children, it's also my job to protect them from being undervalued. With the school system, with their friends, with family, it is my job to say they have a worth, they have a value, and no one will undersell my children. God is looking at you like I look at my children and saying, stop being undervalued. Whether it's internal or external, no one can sell my kids short or make them feel like they aren't worthy. And oftentimes it is us who makes us feel that way. And God is looking at you saying, I don't want you to be undervalued. God the Father is telling you, do not sell yourself short. You have forgotten I have given you the keys to the kingdom. Sometimes I remind my children, especially my boys, you are my children. That means something. It may not mean a lot to a bank account. It may not mean a lot to other people. But to me and to this house and to the people we know, that name you carry means something. And as a Christian, that name you carry of being a child of the Most High King, it means something. And God wants you to pick your head up and be proud of it. And I think the last great duty of a father is to guide their children. I see the talents my children don't see. I know the potential they can't fathom that they have. I see their desires and their capacities. I see their limitations. I see their possibilities, and I do everything I can to make their pathway lead to happiness. God sees everything he created you to be. Every time he sees you, he sees all of your potential. He knows exactly what he made you for, and he's trying to get you to be there. He's trying to get you to get somewhere, and he is trying to guide you. So those storms that are around, those are a part of getting you back on track those challenges that are in your way are a part of evolving you. There is so much that God wants to do for you and knows that he, and he knows that you can do it, but he's trying to guide you there. The, the everlasting principle for me to my children that I've told them a million times is you deserve the best and you're going to be your best. Nothing else will ever happen. You will get the best and you will be the best. And God is looking at you, reminding you, you deserve the best, Christian. You deserve the best, but it's up to you to be your best. Because God is trying to bring you exactly to where he made you to be. I'm going to close out God the Father with this. Like a father, God loves you. What is a father's love like? A father's love is unique. It is purposeful. 
It's simultaneously the most protective force on earth, but it's also a barrier-busting change maker. It challenges you to be more and demand more. A father's love builds a confidence in you that can't be touched. A father's love shapeshifts to your needs, whether you need to be supported right now or you need to be pushed and told to get up right now. A father's love is what many use to give them the courage to take risks. There are risk takers right now who have been successes, millionaires, bank account owners, who have made their way because their father built a reliability in them that says, I can take risks because my father is loving me. Whether you succeed or fail, the love is always there. It's always pushing you forward. A father knows his kids deserve the world, and he uses his love to make sure they get it. So if you're curious of what God the Father is like, his love is exactly like that. It is everlasting. It is powerful. It is changing. It is going to be what you use to build your confidence upon. Now, one of my favorite titles of God, because I like to throw it in the face of people who don't believe, God the Creator. Ephesians 2.10, for we are God's masterpiece. I'm a masterpiece, and so are you. And sometimes you walk by the mirror and you don't feel that way. Sometimes you hold your phone out and you get the bank account up and you think, I'm not a masterpiece. But God right here in his word is telling you, we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. The thing I like to throw in the face of those who don't believe is no matter what you say about me, my God says I'm a masterpiece. The creator loves what he did. Now, what is a creator like? What are some elements of creation? I always think of painters and sculptors. And one thing I know that they all have is a pride in their work. A creator beams with pride every time their creation is brought up. If anybody ever looks to you and says, Hey, did you make that? You say, yeah, of course I did. That's pretty awesome, isn't it? You paint something and you put it on the wall and people go, oh, that's nice. And you go, yeah, I made it. God is doing that with you as you walk through. He's telling the angels, look at that. I made that. You know that? Hey, that's Stephen. I made Stephen. You know that? Actually, it was a few years ago that uh, I even added, added some things to Stephen. Sometimes I take the painting off the wall and I add a little more to it and I put it back up. God is proud of you the way a painter is proud of their paintings. Christians, there has not been, is not currently, and will never be a moment that God is not happy he made you. God is always happy he made you. He is always beaming with pride that he made you. And do you know what else happens with a creator and their creations? They have a purpose that the creator gave them. If a creation ever wanted to know its purpose, the only way for that to happen is it has to find its creator. We've all seen the sci-fi shows where there's some kind of robot and they're looking out for, why was I made? I'm the only one of my kind. And what do they do? They all search for their creator. And in life, we're all looking for our meaning. We're all looking for our purpose. And so often we forget to go to the source and go to the creator and say, why did you make me? Because the truth is, God made you on purpose and for a purpose. And he doesn't just know your purpose. He's what gave it to you in the first place. God is got a purpose for you. And if you need to know it, you go to him and you find it. And this is my favorite. One I have to remind myself all the time. A creator knows just the right framework for its painting. You know, the Mona Lisa would be nice no matter what, but it sure does look a lot better in a frame, doesn't it? I can't imagine somebody painting the Mona Lisa and then getting some thumbtacks and just kind of pinching it against the wall and hoping that it sticks. No, he had a vision in mind when he made that, and they figured out the exact framework to highlight that painting, to make sure that all the elements that didn't need to be hidden weren't hidden, and everything that needed to be seen was seen, and that it was beautiful enough to catch your eye but not distract you from the painting. See, a painter doesn't simply create a picture. They select the perfection around it as well. By the time the painter is done painting the painting, still got work to do because a framework needs to be built around it. You are a painting and God is putting a framework around you, making sure that the beauty he created shines just 
right. So that circumstance you're in is not something happening to you. It is something the creator decided for you. God has done that for you. The city that you're in, the people around you, the finances you have, the opportunities you've been afforded, they're all perfectly crafted to show your beauty, to show the beauty of God within you. He put a little bit of himself inside of you, and he's got you in just the right picture frame of life so that people look at you and go, man, God is good. God is good. He has got you exactly where you want to be. So when I think of God the creator, I think that I'm just a painting. I'm just a sculpt, a sculpture. I'm just his craft work. If he wants to pick me up and take me somewhere, I'm just going to let it happen. And I'm going to trust that my creator didn't stop painting me, didn't make me incomplete. He didn't make mistakes. And he didn't forget my framework. He put me exactly where I'm supposed to be. And I remind myself that if I'm God's art, art doesn't pick its surrounding. The artist does. No painting has ever gone, I don't actually want to be in a museum. You know why? Because paintings don't talk. And sometimes it's good for you to act like a painting and don't talk and just let God do what he wants to do. Sometimes it's good for you to be a sculpture, to stand still and let God move you, to stop trying to take the keys and the reins. Do you know if a sculpture ever was to try to create itself, nothing would happen? And so often you try to get yourself a hammer and you try to get yourself every little bit of crafting materials and build a life for you and you're not doing anything. Because God is your creator. Stop arguing with God on where you should be and just let him put you where he decided a long time ago. It says in that scripture what he had in store for you a long time ago. You see, God knew the purpose and then he made you. He didn't make you and then try to figure out what room you belong in. God saw a room of life that you belonged in, put the framework there, and then placed you exactly where you belong. Be proud of that. And I want to close this out with a, a quote from Henry Ward Beecher, who I think, to me, this is a spiritual quote. This is something that I feel is so key to thinking about yourself as a painting and a masterpiece of God. Remember, you are just a masterpiece. God is the creator. Every artist dips his brush in his own soul and paints his own nature into his pictures. So when God made you, he dipped a little bit of his soul, a little bit of his nature, and he painted you. That smile on your face, that's God. That kind heart in your, in your life is God. The humor that you have is God. The ability to take the punches and keep positive, that's God. You have been created by an artist who put his soul into it, and it is the most beautiful soul that there is. It is the most beautiful nature to have. So you are not a mistake. You are not half-crafted. You are crafted to absolute perfection because God dipped his perfection he got a little brush and covered it in his own nature, covered it in his perfection, and then he made you. And that is shining within you. So when you think of God the creator, be proud to have been created by him. And I want to think about another one today, another title. And uh, this is fun for me because I'm going to get into a bit of a hobby of mine or a, a great love of mine, uh, wrestling here. Uh, and God is the king of kings. Isaiah 33, 22. For the Lord is our judge, our lawgiver, and our king. He will care for us and save us. God is refuge. A good king provides his people with a place of solace. His people trust him endlessly, and they benefit from his rule. Let God be your peace and benefit from his rule. Back in the medieval ages where there was lots of bad kings around, there was lots of corruption, there was lots of people who are unqualified because oftentimes a good king would die and then their bratty little son would get the throne and mess it all up. You don't have that. You're a part of the medieval times where you've got a good king who's creating a kingdom of peace and solace, a kingdom of comfort, a kingdom where you can trust him and benefit from his rule. When times are hard, you should look for God because he is going to provide you with peace. 
And the truth that any historian knows is that peace is the spoil of war reserved for the winners. Let me tell you something. God is the winner every time. Peace belongs to God. Peace is for the winner of the war, and God is the winner of the war. That's why he got his title, King of Kings, because when everybody else, the devil, the king of lies, tried to take over, he knocked him back down. When the demons tried to come back into your life, he knocks them back down. God is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. In God, there is peace. This I know. A king also has dominion over his kingdom. In life, control is hard to come by. And I can tell you from experience that the vast majority of my problems in my life come from two categories. Times it was out of my control and times I lost control. God is always in control. Anytime you've got something precious in your life, you give control to him. The reason that parents come here and they dedicate their child is because they want to make sure that God is in control, not them. When you get baptized, you want to make sure that God is in control, not you. And it is a dedication of that fact that God is the one who's controlling me. God doesn't lose control, and control can't be taken from him because he has dominion. God is the title holder. When somebody holds their belt up high in the wrestling ring, you know that they're the title holder. Well, God's been holding it high for a long time, and has nobody ever gotten close. God is perfection, and God wins every match he's placed against. God is never shocked or rattled by your situation. God is never afraid of what's happening to you. And oftentimes we're like little kids. And I'll tell you from experience, we go running into our dad's house. We go running to God and we're like, hey, 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 uh, there's something wrong. And let me tell you from experience, the other day my son came into the room and he was just petrified and I didn't know what was going on. And there have been times in my life where my kids come running in and they go, dad, dad, dad. And I just go, shh, shh, it can't be that bad. What's happening? And then they tell me something small. It's so big to them. But they tell me something and I set my remote down, take a drink of my drink, and I stand up and I go quietly walk into the kitchen and kill the little bitty spider that's on the microwave. And oftentimes we're like those children just darting into God's house going, God, God, God. And he's like, shh, it's okay. What's going on? Because he has dominion. Do you know why I feel comfortable to do that? It's because I have dominion in my house. And I trust that nothing in my house is bigger than me. God's house is every thing you see. So when you try to bring a problem to him, he looks at it like a father, like a, the man of the house. He looks at it and goes, well, it can't be that bad because I'm the baddest thing in this house. So he's looking at your problems and he understands them. He loves them. I understand. My kids are afraid of spiders and that's fine, but I'm not. So maybe in your life, you're running into God and he, you're scared. And if you just listen close enough, he's telling you, shh, just sit down. I'll take care of it. So God is right there. And my favorite part of God being the king of kings, God is the judge and the lawgiver. Woo, a king decides what happens. In my life, there have been people who tried to decide for me. No, God gets to decide what happens in my life. God, the king of kings, decides what happens. I've seen too many people fall under the weight of pressure that they put on themselves. Stop judging yourself. God is the judge. Stop deciding that you're not worthy of things. God is the one who decides. Stop telling yourself that you got to do this and that, and you put all these rules and limitations on your life. Open up his word. He's already told you what not to do. God gives the laws. God gives the commands. Just listen to them. Oh, it's so good to have somebody when the world is hectic, when the Democrats are taking over and the Republicans complain, and then the Republicans take over and the Democrats complain. It's so good to be able to ignore all of that and just go, God, what's supposed to happen? It is so good. You know, when I was younger, I thought I'd like to be a politician. And now that I'm older, I realize I was an idiot, and, um, <laughs> which may have qualified me to be one. <laughs> and you know, I'm so happy that I've gotten to a place where I don't care. 
I don't care because I can say this and there's plenty of people who voted more times than I have in this building. But I can tell you, no matter what I've done, I can say nothing has changed my situation. Not one vote I've placed has made anything better. But you know what changes me every time? Going to my father, going to the king of kings, going to the creator and telling him my circumstance. You see, when I pray for new financial status in my life, God provides it for me. When I need healing, God provides it for me. The last time I wrote a letter to my senator, I think his secretary threw it away. And I want you to know that you serve a king of kings who's powerful, who's giving law to you, who's already told you what you're supposed to do. And most importantly, he's already made the decision on on what happens with your punishment. And all you got to do is believe in his son and give your life to him. And that punishment goes right away. That don't happen in the world. Because when you spend your life judging yourself and you allow yourself to be judged by others, I hate to break it to you, but you completely ignore the death of Christ when you do that. When you say, I can't, God. God, I've just done too many bad things. You know, I, I used to go to the club and drink, and sometimes I drink too much. And, God, I get angry, and I've, I've you know, hit some people I shouldn't have hit. And, God, I've said some things that I shouldn't say. There are some people who needed me, then I let them down. Every time you decide that what God has in store for you is not for you because you've made too many mistakes, you look at Christ on the cross, and you say, well, that wasn't for me. Stop doing that. You don't have the authority. God is the king of kings. Beth, you're not the king. Jose, you're not the king. Buddy, you look it, but you're not the king. <laughs> I want you to look into your life and see every time you've tried to be the judge and you've tried to be the lawgiver. Now hear me. Hear me right now, and I hope that this disrespects your spirit of the judgment that you have in yourself. Take off God's robes. They don't fit you. Let go of the gavel. It's too heavy for you. And get out of God's throne. You look silly sitting in it. Everything God has is for him. Stop picking up the robes and putting them on and deciding you're the judge. You're not qualified. Stop trying to pick up the gavel. You'll never get it. And stop sitting in God's throne. It's not where you belong. You are not the king of kings. God is the king of kings. God is the judge. And he already ruled on your case. Defendant, forgiven. Crime, forgotten. Case, closed. That's it. He made the law. So he's the only one qualified to rule on it. The devil can't walk into his courtroom and make judgments. When the devil's trying to tell you that you're too depressed, you're too sad, you've got too many anger issues, your addiction issues are bothersome to God, he's not speaking from a place of authority. He is a guest in the courthouse of God. And I want to think about this. Too many people know that God is in control and God is in the judge, and then they argue with what he ruled. Let's think about this for a minute and try to apply that logic somewhere. Imagine for a moment, and I know none of you would ever do this, all right? I know nobody's ever done this in this church, but imagine you ran a red light, right? Now, I know everybody just said, okay, it's not too hard. I've done it several times. Some of you did it on the way here. Some of you woke up late and ran a couple of red lights to get here. Imagine you run that red light, and then you hear, bloop, bloop, and you pull over, and a cop says, well, not only were you running the light, you were speeding. I'm going to go ahead and write you a ticket, okay? Uh, give me just a second, I'll be back in my car right now. Give me just a moment. And they go and they sit in their car and they get on their laptops and they probably check their email and just try to get some scare attacks. I don't know what they do. They can't possibly be using the computer for that that long. I imagine they're playing like Minesweeper or something to pass the time. It, I think it, they literally just sit behind those computers to scare you. And then he comes back out and he says, you know what, actually, you can go ahead and go. I'm not going to write you a ticket. Not one person in this room will go, no, I deserve a ticket. I deserve a ticket. And as a matter of fact, my license is expired and you didn't even notice. If you wouldn't remind a police officer the crimes you've committed, if you wouldn't argue with a judge when they let you go, why are you arguing with the judge when he tells you that your sins are forgiven? We can't apply the logic, so stop using it in the spirit realm. And lastly... Ooh, such a fun title that God has. He is the lion of the tribe of Judah. 
Who God is a lion in Hosea 11:10. It says they will go after the Lord who will roar like a lion and when he roars the children will come trembling from the west. Who God is so powerful. God is so wonderful. And that circumstance that you've been put through, the thing that the devil is trying to scare you with, let me tell you something about a lion. A lion strikes fear in everything around it. When a lion roars, the jungle stops. When a lion's around, the animals get scared. Have you ever seen it? They're all walking around, and then they think they hear a lion, and the gazelles go, oh, oh, okay, I don't see him. And they go back, and they hear another noise. That's the devil. He's off at work trying to put things in in your life, and then God makes a noise, and he's like, oh, oh. The devil is afraid of God. Because the lion of the tribe of Judah strikes fear. Never forget who we serve. God is unbelievably powerful. You know something I dislike more than anything on the planet on Facebook? Is when people have those pictures where God and the devil are like this. And they both got their muscles flexed. And it looks really cool. And the, the, the idea of it is, is kind of nice. But let's just boil it down to why I don't like it. The devil would have his arm snapped clean off. He wouldn't even come to the table. If God said, let's go, let's do it, the devil would run so quick. I don't like those because it is not an accurate representation of what life is like as a Christian. The devil would not be at the table with God even attempting to wrestle with him. And do you know the truth? God is in you, which means you could put yourself in that picture and the devil would still not try it. He is so afraid of God. It's not even a close fight. God versus the devil is not an arm wrestling match. It's kind of like the 1996 Bulls playing my high school JV team. It's nowhere near close. Jordan would score 97 points. I'm fairly certain at my high school, the JV team had four kids who probably needed glasses and weren't wearing them. I don't, I don't know how to say it any better than... God would destroy the devil. God's name petrifies Satan. When you speak the name of God, the devil trembles in fear. You know, uh, getting to wrestling like I talked about, back in the day, the undertaker was a, a thing of fear. And whenever the undertaker would be in a match, the opponents would be petrified. And sometimes they would be like beaten up on his friends. And he had this entrance that was a bell. It would go, Doom! and they would be just in the corner beating their friend up. And yeah, yeah. And then they'd hear, Ding! And every time it would look exactly like this. Boom, boom. And they're just beating up his friend. They're just attacking his brother. And then the bell rings and they all go. <sighs> and they look for him. Because the bell of the undertaker striked fear in his opponents. That's something that they're petrified of. You see, God, if he had an entrance music, it would be that bell to the devil. It would be that moment where they think, oh yeah, I got him right where I want him. And then the gong strikes and they're like, Oh, no. <laughs> Every time it was my favorite thing as a kid because I was scared, too. I wasn't even in the ring. I was at home in a TV, and I was like, boy, I hope he doesn't crawl through the TV and get me. <laughs> but then I'd be excited because, like, wait, no, never mind. He's beating up the bad guy. That is what it is like in the spiritual realm. The devil is that weak opponent who thinks he's got a chance. And when the undertaker comes into the ring... They all back down. You see, never once did any of them stand up and go, let's go, let's do this. Every single time the bell rang, they dropped out of the ring. And a lot of them would be caught like running in the crowd, just leaving. And they'd even show sometimes them getting in the car and driving away. That's what the devil does when he hears God's name. He climbs out of the ring, goes out of town, and he's already on the next venue. God wants you to realize he is the lion of the tribe of Judah. And yes, the devil does his best, but it ain't nowhere near close. It ain't close. That's why the devil does what he does. He can't defeat God, so he tries to pull you away from him. He tries to yank you away from God. And the truth is, he does that because he knows if he ever gets caught, whoo, -hoo -hoo, the devil knows if he ever gets caught messing with God's children, he's going to get rocked. Whoo! I love just reminding the devil. Sometimes I get a bad doctor's report or I look at my bank account and it's not what it should be. And there's some numbers that I could be afraid of. And sometimes I'll just say, God, God. Because I know the devil's like, hey, shush, stop that. 
because he's petrified, petrified. I don't go look into the bank account. I don't call Wells Fargo and go, hey, I thought I had this amount of money. I don't go to the doctor and say, well, what are we going to do? I just speak the name of God because when the devil is on your back and you remind him that God is watching, he just lets go and goes, okay, I'm, okay. I'm not going to try you anymore. Too often we forget that we have a lion of the tribe of Judah just waiting to strike fear into the devil. I want you as Christians to be so close to God, the devil's too scared to even try you. You know, when I was a kid and I looked at The Undertaker and I would watch the little tag team matches and I said to myself, I'd watch them wrestling and then I'd see like, oh, their friends are getting beat up. I said, I don't think I'd ever leave his side. Everybody's afraid of him. Why would you do anything else but stand right next to him? If I was in a wrestling match, I would be this close to him. And so if, you know, like uh, Andre the Giant was next to me, like, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? You can try this guy? As a kid, I thought about that. And I thought, if I ever got the chance to get into the ring, I would, be, I would tie myself to The Undertaker. I would tie myself to Hulk Hogan. I would, I would just get so close that if somebody even thought about trying me, they'd be like, well, you got to handle this guy first because, I mean... He's going to stop you. I want you to do that with God. I want you to get into the spirit realm and wrap yourself around God. So that way when the devil is like, oh, there's a doctor's report, you can go, okay, we'll try it. There's space. Can you get into it? Go ahead and try. God's name strikes fear into the devil. Stop talking about Christianity like it's on the verge of being defeated. I'm so tired of hearing all the defeatist talk when it comes to Christianity. God is a lion of the tribe of Judah. Nothing beats the lion. Nothing beats him. You hear all the time, we can't pray in schools. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. And I know you can, and you know you can, because each and every one of us has had a moment where we thought we were going to be in a wreck, and we prayed while we were driving. Each and every one of us, when we got stopped at that red light, prayed right there. We didn't drop down to our knees. We said, God, please, just... Let the officer be nice today. Hope maybe like him and his wife had a really good morning and he's feeling really happy. Like every single one of us has prayed in a circumstance that would be more difficult to pray in than schools. Yeah, we can't pray the way you think we should, but don't put the idea in kids' heads that they're not even allowed to pray. That's defeatist. You can pray. What are they going to do? Crawl into your spirit and stop you? They're going to jump in your brain and tell you stop it? They can't tell you to stop praying. You can pray whenever you want. I'm praying right now. All the lawmakers hate God. Well, that's nice. It, you know, it's probably true, but uh, God's the lawmaker. And what they say doesn't matter. So even if they rule that we can't meet in this building, I'm going to tell you right now, there's some trees back there that have enough shade we could be hidden in. I'll be there next week preaching. You want to come? They can't stop me. They can't stop God. Oh, society is sinful. Yes, it is. You don't got to dip your feet in it. You don't got to dip your feet in it. Oh, you see, the, the world is so promiscuous. You don't got to join. The world is so full of alcohol and drugs. You don't got to drink or pop. You can stay clean. You can stay away from it. Society is sinful. That's right. But God the Father is still in control. God the King of Kings is still in control. Church ain't what it used to be. Yeah. Yeah. Nothing is. Things change. Things move forward. That's okay. Church may not be what it used to be, but it is what it is today. And if we spend all day hoping and wishing that it would be something that it's not, if we can go back to all the old times, we'll forget where we are and the power of what we have. I remind people that there is a beauty in what the church used to be. There is such a power in what the church used to be that it was the focal point of a local culture. But do you know what would have happened? Back in the day, if COVID hit and people weren't able to meet and convene, they would have had to do church in their homes, and they would have done that. But look at the power of what church is today. A lot of us still turned on messages from Pastor Avery. A lot of us still heard Tanisha and Alicia sing worship. Like, there's a beauty in what we have. There's power in what we have because there's always power in the lion. God is too big to be defeated because he's a fighter. God, the lion of the tribe of Judah, is a fighter. So many times in my life I've felt defeated, and then from out of nowhere, God saves me. Every time. 
every time I think the devil's got me down from out of nowhere. It's like those moments in wrestling where you think, oh, man, the match is over. And they lift their feet and they go, one, two. And then from out of nowhere, their tag team their tag team per, uh, partner comes up and stops it. The devil's got you pinned down so many times, and he's about to get the three count, and then God walks in and says, nah, not going to happen. So many times in my life that God has gotten me up from the devil's attack. I've been laying face down, waiting to be defeated, and God said, no, get up, get up. And he shooed the devil away, and he knocked him out of the ring, and he lifted me up, and he reminded me who I am. Because when I use my breath to pray, it's suffocating to the devil. I got breath in my lungs. And when I use that to call out the name of God, it's like the devil is being choked right there. To the devil, God's name is like having that lion's paw pressed against his throat. It's like that scene in The Lion King where the hyenas are picking on Simba and he does his little roar and they're like, ha, 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 what a loser. And then he does it again and Mufasa's there this time. And the roar is so big and powerful that they shake and they say, no, 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 we weren't going to do anything to your son. That's what it's like. I love The Lion King because Mufasa reminds me of God sometimes where he just jumps in when I've gotten myself in trouble. I walked into the little elephant graveyard. I got myself in front of the hyenas and I got myself in trouble I couldn't handle. And when the trouble is trying to break me, when the devil is trying to bring me down, I try to roar and nothing happens. But then I try again, and there's my father with a loud and mighty roar, telling the hyenas, telling the enemies, you better leave them alone. I love that scene because I know just like Mufasa, God comes and handles business. When God comes, that's it. When life is getting the best of you, don't forget who fights for you. Call on him. You don't fight alone. You are never defeated. The final say belongs to the one who spoke first. The first words ever spoken belong to God. And the last words spoken in your situation belong to God. Don't forget, you have the lion of the tribe of Judah on your side. And sometimes you're getting beat down and you're trying to fight. And what you need to do is turn around and tag God in and let him take care of the match for you. Because you're losing and God's going to win for you. Life is a fight sometimes. Don't fight in their ring. Fight in ours. Come to the altar and pray. And when I said my situation is as difficult and life is hard sometimes, I want you to know that every time I've come to an altar, my situation was altered. Every time I came down here and prayed, something changed. Every time I've prayed, I got up and I said, you know what? God did something, baby. God changed something. I don't know what it is, but there's something brewing. And that's because when I prayed, I woke up the lion of the tribe of Judah, and he roared a mighty roar that scared the demons off, that put the devil back in his place, that reminded my spirit how powerful he is. Instead, I want you to do one thing. Remind yourself that your circumstance is changed through prayer. Your circumstance is changed because who is God? He is the lion of the tribe of Judah. He can't be defeated. Yes, there might be some things in society you think that the church is failing on and you think that Christianity is falling apart. It's not. God will never be defeated. God is never defeated. I read the end of the book, we win. I read the end of every chapter, we win in every chapter. There's not one story in the Bible that God loses at. God is so mighty so powerful and your circumstance that you think is so big and so powerful is just a little bitty thing to God and he knows he can fix it right now there are those of us who have come to this building and the devil is trying to break us down you might have come here with some kind of financial problems some family problems some mental health crises some some scary doctor's report I want you to know I'm about to call you to the altar and when you come down here for prayer, we're going to wake up that fighter known as God Almighty. And he's going to walk into your circumstance and tear the devil up. Oh, God is ready to fight for you. And the devil is outside these walls just hoping you didn't call on God today. He's just hoping that he can get his claws back into you. But we're not going to leave this building until we've woken up the lion of the tribe of Judah and I'm going to end my sermon with a quote from one of my favorite trash talkers in WWE. I want you to think about this, okay? The devil 
and God are in a fight. God is going to tear the devil up. And to quote Paul Heyman, that's not a prediction. That's a spoiler. It's going to happen.